Welcome to another episode of the Brown and Black Podcast. My name is Jack Rico. And I'm Mike Sargent. And every week we take a look at race and pop culture through a brown and black let. Well, Mike, the last time we did a podcast episode, it was called Influencers versus Critics. Who is the future of film criticism? And this had happened because a few articles had come out regarding influencers now being the new hot flavor critics for studios. And, you know, a lot of that was because of the ability for the studios and the PR firms to be able to manipulate them, right? Unlike a major media outlet that has hundreds of years of ethical guidelines and experience in those matters. And then all of a sudden, like, since that episode that came out not long ago, we're two now weeks confronted, ago. <laughs> two weeks ago, we're now confronted with this crazy article this expose, because I don't know how else to say it, in New York Magazine by journalist Lane Brown titled The Decomposition of Rotten Tomatoes. Well, there's so much to unpack here. And, and just to, to contextualize it for those who are listening, we're film critics. And part of our perspective on this is, is whether we're relevant or not and how that's changed through, you know, through technology influencing and delivery systems, all of that. And the article is talking about how, let's just say critical power has been replaced by the collective voice of the masses. And if the collective voice of the masses is what matters, what do the critics matter? And how are they, let's just say, what makes something fresh and not fresh? And what the article shows us is that they actually realize the weakness in the way that Rotten Tomatoes does their aggregation is that it doesn't matter if you're a top critic or you're a critic who has maybe a blog and 12 people follow you, your vote is counted the same. So if you reach out to somebody who has very little influence and say, hey, could you give this film a good review? Could you just not let it be rotten? Well, that'll completely change the way something is seen on Rotten Tomatoes. And Rotten Tomatoes has now essentially completely changed the way the industry, the way studios, a film like Indiana Jones, because it mm -hmm. played at the Cannes Film Festival and all the critics there are, let's just say, a lot snootier. Their reviews were not good. So for six weeks, you've got these really bad reviews sitting there for Indiana Jones. So the word starts to spread. <gasps> Indiana Jones is a stinker. Now, when it finally comes out and critics stateside and people who are more friendly, maybe it goes up to 63 as opposed to like 24. But now the word is out. So this has happened repeatedly. And they cite a number of examples where a film, depending on its Rotten Tomato scores, it may make money. We can witness a number of films like the Ant-Man Quantum Mania before it got trashed by critics it had a good score but then it got trashed by critics had a bad score it dropped 69 percent at the box office so now rotten tomatoes is a powerful force and who owns rotten tomatoes so that's what this article goes into now what am i leaving out jack <laughs> I, I mean listen this whole article called the decomposition of rotten tomatoes you can go check it out on uh, vulture.com it highlights a broader issue, and that issue is consensus culture. Correct. And this consensus culture asks a very real question, is what is the damage done when we all conform to consensus culture, especially within the arts and culture world? And how complicit are we in the deterioration of that art and of that quality because we're also because of our love for for consensus culture we're kind of killing off the film critic and that's kind of the question i want to be able to ask you man like 
like if you if you go down this route of consensus culture, Mike, where whether we like it or not, whether this podcast exposes the problem and along with this article and we talk about it ad nauseum, will people change even though they know that it's that it's a threat? Dude, you've just jumped to the end of what I was going to say in this whole show. Yeah. All right. So let's put that at, let's front load that. That's the problem because I, I was going to read to you these headlines of how it's been covered. All right. IGN, Rotten Tomatoes under fire after PR firm's scheme to pay critics for positive reviews. Daily Beast, Rotten Tomatoes quietly buried film at center of expose. Collider, how studios manipulate Rotten Tomatoes scores to their advantage. SF Gate, Rotten Tomatoes is garbage. Now here's proof. Okay, and then, like you said, the leader, Rotten Tomatoes still has Hollywood in its grip. Now, here's the thing. All of those publications, who's, who's reading those? The general public doesn't read Collider. Okay, the general public's not reading IGN or Vulture. Uh, they're not. They don't care. I, I don't think that this will change anything. I think people who go to Rotten Tomatoes and look there just to see, oh, is it good? Is it bad? Uh, is it fresh? Is it not fresh? They will stay the same. And what you just said, I, I like the term, and I think we should use that, consensus culture, where it's it's sort of the evolution of the hot or not. You get to vote on everything. Swat. Well, you had sent me an article on Roger Ebert. Yes. If you really break down the origins of Rotten Tomatoes, which is a fresh and a rotten, mm -hmm. you got to go back down to the, the, the original derivative of this, which is the thumbs up. And the thumbs, the thumbs down. down. Exactly. That's how they tied it into Roger Ebert. Which but, but, All right. So let's do this as an A and B comparison. Okay. Mm-hmm. Rotten Tomatoes is just the digital evolution of Siskel and Ebert. Unfortunately, it's its yes, natural it is. progression. And the thing is, why did those two specifically work? Well, why? I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts on that. That's a very good question, Jack Rico. What's happened over time is you, you don't really look to, there aren't that critic that you go to. And who's going to sit and read a long three-page review of some film? Who does that? Only people who are like total film enthusiasts. So those people, they don't care about Rotten Tomatoes anyway. So the general public doesn't have a critic that they go to. The general public just wants to know, is it good or is it bad? That's I my think, take. I want to know what you think now. I think this really get, has to go down more of a biological path to me. Consensus. Why? Do we love it so much? Why is our first reaction to go to consensus as opposed to read a long form, Mike's favorite way of doing things, long form <laughs> journalism, long form reviews, long form everything? Why don't we take the intellectuality of that? Why doesn't 327 million people do that at the same time, Mike? We've had hundreds of thousands of years to do this. Yet we don't. Yet here we are trying to force people to do something biologically that they are not wired for. And for me, it's about comfort. It's about practicality. It's the fact that anything difficult is going to kill my mojo. And this is where you end up getting herd mentality, group think. And I get it. We're wired somehow to be with the group, not alone. So our brains are looking at, oh, this is a group of people that have created a consensus. And look, 2,500 reviews from the audience. And look, 450... What am I going to read that's going to change all that? These guys must be right. And you know what? I got fooled on that for years. I got suckered. And whatever other critic says no, bullshit to you, my brother. We all got fooled. And you know what? The concept is a great fucking concept. You know what I used to do before Rotten Tomatoes? I had to go to 
every single outlet and read every single review to then create my consensus of it. If you want to make it easier for me, I would love that. Thank you, Rotten Tomatoes. They just ethically threw everything to the garbage. I'll end it with this. This is how, this is the problem with Rotten Tomatoes. The concept is great, but the execution of it and maintaining that from decades to decades to decades is just not going to work, especially when algorithms seem to be dictating filmmaking. Go back to 2018. Black Panther's coming out. Whoa. What's going to be the reaction? What's Rotten Tomatoes going to say? And then we find out that there was a white nationalist group that had threatened on Facebook to give Black Panther, to troll Rotten Tomatoes to get the score down, to make it rotten. And if you look at The Last Jedi, you look at Captain Marvel, there are your examples, but instead of black, it's female. So if you can hack it, if you can change it, if you can manipulate it, then how accurate have all of these films been? If we know there are PR firms that are paying critics 50 bucks to write a positive review, if we know that PR firms and studios are wink-winking these critics who are mostly poor and have no other opportunities, and because we live in a capitalistic system that it's all about entertainment as escapism, we'll do this shit for free. Are you kidding me? Talk about movies, meet celebrities, go to premieres. That's the life. <laughs> and so quality goes out the window. This is, this doesn't make sense the way it's set up right now. Something has to change. Well, a couple of things I have to touch upon. You, you, you hit so many points there that I, 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 I had to refrain from, from commenting. But one, I think, yes. And, and that is what you said happened in 2018 and with a number of female, let's say female driven films, or, or they wanted to do it with Barbie even, but they couldn't anymore because Fandango is one of the people that owns uh, Rotten Tomatoes, and so you have to prove that you have bought that tickets. That conflict of interest all over, man. Dude, this dude, is the Paramount yeah. decree. Uh, of course it is. But now, so this is what they did, okay? And yeah, having two film studios, various, various, if you read the article, various hands have bought Rotten Tomatoes, and they're all media companies. Let's put it like that. Or people who would have a hand in the movie business, whether it's Universal or Warner Brothers or Fandango. But Here's what's also interesting about what you were saying about the biological, coming back to what you said, because I agree with you that it is biological, that we, we do gravitate towards a herd mentality. But I also think there's another factor here. And that other factor is, and, and you just broke it down. And this is something that we've touched upon when we talked about AI. And that is people would rather not have to think. People would rather have somebody else or something else do their <laughs> so thinking true. for them. That's true. They would. It's like, I, I don't want to think. Okay. If you listen to me, you, you go on a date with a woman and you don't know where you're taking her. She's going to be pissed. She's not going to go on a date with you again. People don't want to have to think that, that, that they spend their days thinking. I don't want to have to spend 20 minutes, an hour figuring out what movie to see tonight. Let's just look at Rotten Tomatoes, like you said. So it makes our life easier, but there's the problem. If we stop thinking, if we allow others now, here's another factor. Most people get their opinions from somewhere else. So people aren't necessarily, and we're not even, let's not even get into education and critical thinking, but for the most part, people get their opinion from somebody else and, and they have no problem with just going with, like you said, no, the herd we have mentality. All, we have a whole generation that yes. gets their news from TikTok. Exactly. And listen, <laughs> no offense from TikTok, but TikTok journalism is not real journalism unless it's from a journalism outlet like the Washington Post. So if you're looking at quality, I don't necessarily think Rotten Tomatoes is giving us the greatest quality of criticism. But people aren't looking for quality. That's what I'm trying to say. They're not look they're looking for an easy answer. People are not looking for quality. If they were fast food would not exist. So what's the damage of that if we continue at this pace? 
I think it's the same damage of like, what's the damage of having McDonald's and, and, and Burger King? Like we have a lot of people who are unhealthy. I think that what, what you're saying is the damage is that it, uh, let's say it's twofold because what we haven't even really gotten to, you were talking about the consensus. Uh, uh, what, what, what was the phrase you used? The consensus culture culture. Yes. The consensus culture. You talk about the consensus culture. Okay. The consensus from who? You also cited a couple other things. What's the dominant culture? And if the dominant culture now has more of a say, because let's be real, the one thing we do know is democracy is a sham. So anything that seems like democracy has always got built in ways to corrupt it. That's just how we do. We as humans, like you look at them all, they're all built that way. So here's the thing. A film, like you said, Black Panther, uh, a film that that has some import, the film that should be looked at, that wouldn't be looked, a film that has something to do with women's rights, has to do with being Latino, has to do with LGBTQ or anything, is vulnerable now. So mm-hmm. while while the playing field is leveled in some ways, now we have 3,500 critics on Rotten Tomatoes. 3,500, that's... That's mind blowing, man. I myself became a rotten tomato approved a critic during this push to bring in more diversity. So I get it. And I've been approached by a number of publicists. Hey, we see that you're rotten approved. Any good view would be very helpful. I, I, I've been approached. I've been approached wow. by friends. Oh, sure. Friends who are filmmakers. Hey, we're, well, it just, so yeah, it, it gives you as a wow. critic, it gives you some power now. It gives status. you status. Exactly. I don't have to be Roger Ebert, but I'm Rotten Tomatoes approved. So now. Wow. So, so what does that say about us as people? Man? Well, see, this comes down to Ugh. this comes down to a show that we're going to do on relevance because that is something we chase. Yeah. And and in film criticism, it's how do you stand out in a field of thirty five hundred? You're not. But if somebody reaches out to you. <gasps> Yes, well, yeah, what's the film? Okay, right. send me a link. So to me, w- w- when I think about the future of allowing us to just Rotten Tomato anything, because what's to say that Rotten Tomatoes goes, wow, dude, we, we've hacked the biology of the human species. Why don't we extend this not only to movies uh, and TV shows, but podcasts and politics? and news and start to slowly slowly program the mind of society through through consensus. (laughs) (laughs) Mike, this is what could happen. Well, dude, I think I know I'm uh, dramatizing it. You know, uh, I know you're not even dramatizing. It's already happened, man. Listen, there are sites now. Rate my teacher. Rate my doctor. You can get a consensus on just right, about- but they're not brand names. So imagine you put a brand name on it. Imagine you corporatize it. That's what I'm saying. It's an IPO public company on Wall Street. That's what I'm saying. And so, Ryan Tomatoes, to me, the damage done if you allow yourself as the moviegoer to just look at it and not read anything or just go in it that blindly is that studios start getting comfortable with your consumer behavior. They go, Oh, this guy doesn't give two hoots about quality. So why the hell should I make a movie about quality to win an Oscar award when I can make a killing just feeding this dude sugar? (laughs) Yeah. And to me, that's a major, major damage because we'll never discover the next Kubrick like that because you're never going to be allowed to put a polarizing film that challenges the status quo in any way. So studios are going to end up creating movies aimed at the fresh meter of Rotten Tomatoes. How fucking sad will that be? Well, that's it for this episode of Brown and Black. If you would like to support this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. Your help will allow us to be heard by many more people. You can follow our comments and opinions on at Brown Black Podcasts on Twitter, or should I say X, Instagram, and now on YouTube. 
We'll see you on the next episode of Brown and Black.